You know, I've heard people describe you as Mr. Dependable when you get that button. Where where do you get that energy from when you're running a four by four and you get that button? You always seem to come out on top on your leg. So as it is right now, you're not coaching any any Jamaicans. So let's say I'm out of high school. I'm not training with a club, but I realize that I can run. Who do I go to in order to get a tryout to become something great? I'm not coaching any 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 elite athletes. I, um, hopefully from your platform, some people will see me and see that I need some athletes. They will it. come to Auburn. Auburn, Texas yeah. Tech, LSU. Yeah. I don't think you guys have a problem getting okay. Jamaicans. Gibson will be celebrating their 50th. You need to be okay. there. And you and you also need to be at Champs. And I, I guess I need to come down and do some recruiting. Yeah. Yes, you should. You should. Because where are you now? You're at Arkansas? No, Auburn University. Auburn. Oh, my God. They yeah. will come to Auburn. Auburn, Texas yeah. Tech, LSU. Yeah. I don't think you guys have a problem getting okay. Jamaicans to. But you should. You should. Because... Javon was really, really looking good. I watched the trials from here on television and, um, you know, and I was like, who is coaching Javon? And then someone said, um, Lassina's husband. And I said, you mean Davian? And they said, I yes. I go by, I go by Lassina's husband. No. Yeah. You... <laughs> <laughs> oh my, well, so, <laughs> but I don't even know, but I'm sure it's not the first year. Getting... I get it all the time. You get it. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> that was what they said. They said, Lassina Golden Clark husband. I said, oh, you mean Davian, Mr. Fortis. And they said, yes, but, um, I hope he can continue because he was one of my younger, my young, bright prospects. So I'm hoping that, you know, he will keep it up. And he made the finals, right? Oh, got no, to the semis. Finals, yes. Yeah, he got to the semis. So, Davian, looking back at your track and field career, do you have any regrets and what would it be if you can share? Not really. I don't regret any I, I guess the only regret was um, that I didn't get an opportunity to um, run more 200 meters when once I became a professional um, uh, uh, athlete, as well as more 200 meters when I was in college. I just kind of, I regret specializing. I should have kept on. Um, but 2-4 is a tough double, Davian. That's a tough Yeah, double. I know, I know, I know. And that's why, um, that's why I kind of just figured the – Running the 400, I could be on the Jamaica national team if uh, Jamaica at the time had a, a process of not selecting 200 meter runners because they can't be on the four by one and they can't be on the four by four. So you were kind of um, you know in the middle. So I um, that kind of that's kind of why I, I just kind of moved away from the 200. But I regret not running it more because I normally only run the 200 maybe in March sometimes in April, but I never ran the 200 when I was a professional in June and July and August. So I never got to um, showcase my talent. Not for me, but just so on paper so that people could see how fast I, I, I actually am. You know, I've heard people describe you as Mr. Dependable when you get that button. Where where do you get that energy from when you're running a four by four and you get that button? You always seem to come out on top on your leg. Where do you get that energy from? I don't know. Tell me. I, I think with, with relays, you are only you can only focus on the person in front of you or focus on yourself if there's nobody in front of you or if you're too far behind so i think i was able to kind of lock in and zone in in the in the in the relay that's why i had so much success while in the 400 you have to you're, you're trying to focus on the person in lane eight you're trying to look at the person behind you person in front of you so i think i was a little i, I wasn't as locked in when i run the open races and so um the, that distraction didn't allow for me to showcase my talent when I ran the open races. But then after having, you know, those failures in the open 400 and then getting the second opportunity to run at the meet, then I was determined always. Laid all out. Yeah, well, not not really laid all out, but 
I know that I'm in great shape and then I've, I, I, I'm determined to show people that I'm a much better athlete than, than the one they saw earlier in the week. And so, and, you know, you know, after you make a mistake, you know, you, yes. you, you, your, your brain starts looking at things logically. And so my mindset going into the four by four was way different than my mindset going into the 400. Have you ever competed while you're injured or in pain? Oh, always. <laughs> That's part of being a professional athlete because you're asked to compete um, based on the sponsor. So why not just withdraw? Why not just withdraw? What kind of mental system do you use to compete while in pain and still do so well? Well, so remember, you know, and that's why I said with these young athletes, they have to understand when you're a professional, you get paid to compete. So every time you withdraw, your sponsor loses confidence in you. Your country loses confidence in you. So they're less likely to put you on the team. If I'm on the relay and stop in the four by four and say my leg hurts, then the next four by four team, they're not going to select me because they're like, I'm not sure if I can depend on you. Yes. So, so it, you it, have it, a point there. Yeah. So it's not from a personal um, uh, aspect why you make those decisions. You make those decisions because this is how you're paying your bills and you'd make those decisions because you know, you have people relying on you as far as your teammates, you know, on those relay teams, sometimes there's a financial aspect of it. You know, you have $60,000 to finish first place in the relay. You can't afford to stop when uh, all your other teammates are depending on this money to, you know, there might be a down payment on their house, you know, a down payment on their car, money to pay for their kids to go to school, you know. So when you become a professional, there's there's less room to do stuff like that. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're in a, an environment where you're well taken care of, then you'll you'll decide, hey, not to compete because, you know, hey, I'm not going to be at my 100%. So that's different. But you have to be in that situation. But when uh, athletics is your job, you know, Michael Jordan used to play when he's sick. He played when yes. his father died. You know, he could have said, hey, I don't want to play, but he has responsibility to his team. A matter of fact, a matter of fact, Michael Jordan won his, I think it was 99 or 2000 when he won that ring. He was actually sick. He was actually having a flu or something like that. So, you know, you're right. But do you miss the sport? And if yes, what do you miss the most? Yes, I miss the sport, but I get to live through the athletes that I coach. I have the, I'm, I'm overcome with the same emotion you know, I, I can see the mistakes that they make and I can see when they do it right. And then I get excited and start yelling. So uh, I just miss the feeling, you know, the how it feels when you do something good and and, and you have and you have success. Uh, I don't miss the pain, the training <laughs> or getting up early. Right. Yes. Yes. But I know but I know those parts are also um, important because you can't have the success unless you go through the pain. Indeed. Uh, so as, as a coach, uh, I know that part is very important. You competed in the hurdles. You competed in the 200, the 400, four by one, the whole works. If you were to come out of retirement and run one race for Jamaica, which event oh. would you come out of retirement and compete in for Jamaica? Just one. Just one. Oh, mm. 400 hurdles. <laughs> Wow. I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't ready for that answer. Wow. <laughs> so if you like that event so much, why is it that you did not pursue it? Switch like Danny McFarlane and try that event and see, you know, how your luck would go. Yeah, I was just, I, I, I just didn't, I didn't feel confident racing. So I I, I never um, went okay. ahead. Because 400 hurdles, you have to spend a lot of time uh, learning how to hurdle with your opposite leg. Mm-hmm. That, uh, you can use both. Um, Danny, Danny tried to do it with only one leg, so he was a lot more confident than. And I he was won there. silver. Yes, he yes. won a silver medal. Yeah, but yeah, he had the heart for it. I, yes, I don't think the heart. So that's why I didn't do it. You're so a you for, you're a fortis man, Davian. Come on. Yeah, what is what is your motto again? What is your motto? The brave may fall, but never yield. There you go, sir. There you go. Yeah, but those hurdles are high. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they are. They are. They are. What is your fondest memory competing at champs? 
as a junior? Probably my second year at Champs Class 2, winning the, the 200, breaking the record, and winning the 400, and getting silver medal in the hurdles. I thought I should have won the hurdles, but I was second. But uh, yeah, that was my um, fondest moment, um, having the, that success, uh, bringing all those points to the team and uh, competing in the 4 by 4 relay with my uh, with my teammates. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't win champs when I was at Kingston College. No, you finished. didn't? Yeah, I think the highest we finished was fifth. But we kind of laid the foundation for the next group to win. Fifth in the 90s? Yeah, uh, at the time, when early 90s when I was okay. there. The late, the late 90s, they won after I left. But yeah, they won maybe four years or three years after I left. Okay, okay. What is your fondest memory competing as a professional slash for Jamaica? I like the, the 1995 World Championships in um, Gothenburg, Sweden. I love the city. I love the up, um, being able to walk around the city at night, you know, and uh, it, it wasn't cold. It, it was, you know, 68, 70 degrees. You know, it was cool rather than cold, but I love that city and the people and being able to just walk around everywhere and uh, meeting new people and, 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 and that experience of going to my first um, world championship. Who were some of your teammates? Can you remember? Of course, my um, my roommate was James Beckford. Wow. He was so psyched when he won the um, silver medal that that world championships. I saw for Powell's brother, he was on the team. Oh, uh, Donovan. Donovan. Donovan was there. Um, Michael Green. Um, Michael uh, Green was a sprinter, right? He yeah, won 100, meter 100 yes. Yeah. And, and then obviously my 400 uh, teammates, Gregory Hahn, Danny McFarlane, you know, Michael McDonald. That all, super team. That super team. Dennis Blake, you know, all, all those guys. Uh, we were all excited. Uh, Garth Robinson, we were all excited to showcase our talent and, uh, and show the world what we could do, you know. But, uh, yeah, it was a great team. Uh, our team who, were, who were some of the, the female, the women on, on that 1995 team? Oh, Deanne Hemmings, Merlin Hattie, uh, Cuthbert, Sandy Richards. I all met these people there, and that was my first time meeting them. And they would all come up to me and say, "Who are you? Why you have so much mouth? Why you doing all this talking? Why management make your team captain? I mean, this is your first team." Oh, you were the captain. <laughs> yes. Oh wow. Yeah, I had, to, I had to speak out for them, and I tell them we need more meal money. I had to start a revolution. Can't tell you all these things. A leader. Man. You're a leader, man. A true leader. Yeah. And if the young guys know that they can ask for more meal money, that they're going to cause problems. As you <laughs> said earlier, let them do some research. Let them do some the research. research. You have to find out. <laughs> of all your track and field achievement, which one brought you the most pleasure or joy? Uh, uh, finally winning the gold medal uh, when we won the World uh, Indoor Championship gold medal. And then um, we um, the second time we won... Um, it was because the, the 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 first time we won was the U.S. team failed a drug test, so they gave us a retroactive goal. But the second time was we won, we beat Team U.S., we beat everybody. So that was a, a great moment for me. And then that championship, I was second in the 400 and open 400 as well. So that was in Budapest, Hungary. So that was a great a great weekend for me. And that's uh, where we are going this year. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So hopefully we can go back and um and ride, dominate. Ride that gold wave again Yes, and yes. I'm That's looking I'm looking forward to it. If you were called upon to give the current set of athletes a pep talk, what are some of the things that you would say to them? Um it depends on the time. I'm assuming you mean at the world championships or the mm -hmm. Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, just tell them all the strategies they need and all the things they needed to they need to focus on pre-race and the week before the race because that's the most important the, the two weeks leading up to a championships how you prepare is the most important things and the things you do on, on during those two weeks is what makes the difference you know um, your dietitian will tell you that if you eat beef it, it stays how many days in your system so you know when you're getting ready to race you know you have to figure out what food you need to eat and then do the calculation backwards you say if i'm running at six o'clock 
and I eat chicken how long before this chicken gets to digest into my system to give me energy. So you have to kind of be a student of the game and start to think about things like that more logically rather than just getting up, eating breakfast at seven and not eating for the rest of the day. And then you go to race and wonder why you don't have any energy. So, you know, you have to kind of break things down. Everything is science, basically. And so once you know those things, you'll have success. I, I did some of that, but I, I could have done more of that. And I think if I'd done that, I'd had more success. Before we wrap up, I just want you to go back over your organization a little bit more in 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 closing oh well the president is um is the olympian association of jamaica and uh, they're part of the world olympian association if you google world olympian association they're basically like an alumni organization for olympians so if you look at my name especially on social media I say i always have a oly you know, so that means Olympian. So they're, they're the, 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 the foundation uh, aspect of the of the IOC. Uh, so they put aside money there in the foundation and they use that money to make sure that the Olympics, the, uh, the Olympics will never be over, you know, that they'll, they'll always look into develop young Olympians all across the world and tell them the, the story of the Olympics and make sure people know that, hey, if you do this and do this, it is possible to be one of the greatest, to be the next Usain Bolt, or to be the first, whoever you are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's what that organization does. We go to a lot of seminars um, and interact with organizations in different countries and try to um, see what they're doing in their country to inspire more athletes and uh, to to compete in the Olympics. I remember one time we went to um, Peru, I think, and uh, we met with their organization and uh, they were sharing some of their ideas. And one of the young ladies said that uh, she encourages kids to play table tennis because that helps them with their math and science. And I never heard that before. And so that's how they were trying to get more people into the Olympics by telling them, hey, if you join the Olympic team and play table tennis, you know, your kids are actually going to be better. They get their scores and math are going to be drastically better. How often do, like you're from Jamaica, how often do you have like a workshop or how often do you plan to have like a workshop in your home country? I'm one of the few ones that are in the U.S., um, uh, there's a, a lot. The president is, is in Jamaica and, and all the other people there. I think like seven of us are on the executive board. And so they're all there. So they, they run everything from 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 locally. Okay. So they, but but uh, we don't do a lot of fanfare. So uh, you don't see a lot in the news. But, but they go around to the schools and uh, they make their impact felt that way. But, but we're trying to be more vocal and that's why we're trying to get out to different companies and try to get them to help us uh, support because um, we realize that it's us going out to find people is great, but making ourselves available so people can find us when they need us is the ideal way. And so we, men, we are on the board, we have uh, um, people from different sports, from swimming, you know, not just track and field people. So that's what we're trying to uh, work this, with. Or it's all Olympians, cycling, everybody. And this organization is separate and apart from the JOA, the Jamaica Olympic yes. Association. Yeah, the JOA and the J3, they're taking care of the actual um, trips. You know, their focus is not on developing track and field in Jamaica. J3 ISA does more in development than J3. J3 only oversees the, the national teams. They're focused on getting the national people on the national team and delivering them to the side so that they can wear the, the colors and perform. The actual development of track and field is ISA on the high school level. But what we do understand that there's kids that might not even make it to high school or not smart enough to go to high school. Well, sorry, not smart, but <laughs> almost get in trouble like a software. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, we have people who don't have to go to a college and they can still be an Olympic champion. So we have to kind of find police clubs and stuff like that and encourage people to do sports in those in, in, uh, in that area so that we can pick them up later and transfer them to a, 
Asaf or Paul's coach or, you know, or Mr. Mills so that they can develop them and turn them into the next champion. So, so let those me, are the things we're trying to do. So let me ask you something, because I'm just asking for this segment so that people yes. who would be watching can at least have an idea. So let's say I'm out of high school. I'm not training with a club, but I realize that I can run. Who do I go to in order to get a tryout to become something great? Well, the, 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 the J tree doesn't have anything, so... You'd have to go to one of the clubs and try out for one of the clubs. It's, it's more like soccer. You, you know, you wouldn't go to the JFF to try out for the, you'd have to go to one of the soccer teams first and kind of work your way up. So they would have to find a personal coach or trying to join their local police clubs if their parish still has one. And like the, um, I know in Veer in Clarendon, they have the Alcan, I don't know if they still call them Alcan, Alcan Track Club. So they, they used to facilitate training you know, those young athletes in the community. So, you know, the clubs are what, and that's why we need, all the clubs shouldn't be in Kingston. That's what I think. They need to have one club in every parish. That way they can take care of that mandate, just like all the JFF have clubs in every parish so that they have, they can find players from their parish and then train them and develop them and then hopefully get them onto the national team, which is when they would meet with the JFF people. So the police youth clubs used to be the big uh, supporter of um, developing, uh, but no, I think they still have uh, parish championships. So you can perform unattached at a parish championships and showcase your talent. Very interesting because I know that most of our track and field athletes comes through the rank through high school, primary school, then especially at high school level. So if you weren't discovered in high school, whether you didn't win at champs or you win at champs, but I've never really heard about anybody who has not been a part of the ISA system that yes. made it into, into track and field. You'll hear about people like Asafa who competed at champs, but he did not make it out of the first round. He went back his second year at champs and finished like fifth or six, and he went on to becoming a star because he went to university. But what about that young man or that young lady who went to high school but wasn't interested and just wake up one day and you start working for a company and you go out there and you run and you run fast at age 20? You know, yeah, well, it would have... They have business house championships. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so it, but, but then even at the business those championships that give you a chance to showcase your talent, but you'd still need to find an elite coach so that they can mold that talent into something. Because this is a thing in a track and field, people think is running. Track and field is sprinting and sprinting is an art. Just like oh, me and you, we can't take a ball and arrow and go to the Olympics and shoot a, you know, a bullseye because that takes some skill. Skills. It's not simple, but there's some skill involved that we, you have to practice and attain and somebody have to tell you, hey, this is what you should do. Release the arrow and exhale, you know, rather than when you're inhaling, you know, all the things you have to think, of, think about. So track and field, you have to have an elite coach that can teach you. But, Dave, but, Dave, but Davian, you said something earlier You when you did not have any experience and nobody wanted to take you on. A young lady or a young man in their community who nobody know them from high school as a runner and me now go to a coach and go to one of these coaches and say, um, coach, um, I can run, you know. How am <laughs> I going to prove to that coach that I can run for him to take right. me They'll give you a chance. They'll give you a chance, but it, it might not be the chance that you want. And then you might not be prepared for the chance, you know, because like, I could I could give you a chance right now to run. But if you haven't been training, how well are you going to showcase? So you have to take some time to develop before you go over to him. And then you can show a little bit more skill and then they can look at what you have. Because there's something called coach's eye. So when they see you, they can see if there's something there to work with. But also there's a lot of people that didn't see any talent in me too. But it was my determination that kept me in the sport why um why I was I was able to bloom. So it's, you have, there's there's some self that's going to be um involved. Yeah, you have to I guess as you say, you have to find that and you have to 
push yourself in the right place. But Davian Clark, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure talking to you. And I want to hear some more about your organization because I think it's a good thing that you have going. And there are people out there, there are young people out there that needs an avenue. They need a system. They need to find their way inside. And sometimes they don't even know who to turn to, where to go. Yes. You know, and we really don't have a lot online where you can yeah. just go and Google something and find something. You have to maybe hear it from somebody else or find a community or something. So it was really a pleasure talking to you. And do you have anything you want to say in closing? Thanks for having me on your platform. Really appreciate it. The organization, Olympian Association of Jamaica, is not my organization. It's an organization that's formed under the World Olympian Association. Marvin Anderson is the president. He's there in Jamaica. Um, so people can reach out to him on social media. You you should be able to find him, no problem. Sharon Simpson is also a part of the organization. You can find her on social media, and I'm sure if you reach out to them, they'll give you some advice or return your DM. So you know that's all I have to say. Is Thanks there for a web? Me. Is there a website? I uh, the I think the only social media on like Instagram and um, Facebook and uh, oh. Twitter. Okay, well, thank you very much, Davian. Thanks for your time, and it was a pleasure. And you taught me a lot. I learned a lot about, I learned some more about our history, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.